Good Monday morning, guys. I'm Jerry Miller, and this is Real Talk with Keith Smith. Thank you kindly for joining us. A pleasure to connect with you through the I Love Seville Network in downtown Charlottesville. And, folks, we have a gentleman on today's program that epitomizes downtown Charlottesville, that embodies Woolen Mills, that embodies the spirit of Charlottesville and Central Virginia that we all love to call home. Roger Voisinet is in the house. This guy knows solar like the Pope knows holy water. This guy knows hockey like Eric Lindros does. That's a Philadelphia Flyer reference for you right there. Ooh. This guy knows real estate like few do in this community, and he knows so much on so many topics. He's a host dream. Judah Wickhauer is the director. Nikki Chambliss will join us um, eventually on today's program, but let's go to the two shot and welcome Roger on the program. You got a lot of people watching. You got people already giving you props. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing fine, thank you. Um, Got to say, I've been married now seven years, and it's been the best time of my life. You look fantastic. Thank you. You well, look fit. My wife's a trainer. I go, we go to the gym all the time. We train together. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to give your wife uh, a Jessica. compliment. Roger is looking more jacked and fit than I've seen him ever, and you were already jacked and fit to begin with. And sun-kissed in bronze, yep. fresh from the beach. Well, we went to Virginia Beach last week. We were in the Bahamas with uh, Ludwig and, and others, friends. Craig nice. Redinger was lots of fun. Planning a trip to Canada, where I used to come come from, uh, Toronto and Montreal. Um, Jessica is watching. Yeah, and she gives you the heart emojis. Jessica, he's looking fit. He's looking very fit. Uh, thanks, Jessica. <laughs> Um, all right, we have so many topics we want to cover, and viewers and listeners, chime in with questions, chime in with uh, comments, ask anything you want. The man is a wealth of knowledge. Um, Woody Fincham says, Roger, Mr. Green Realtor. Woody Fincham is excited that you're watching the show. You got Bon Romer giving you some props right now. John Blair on LinkedIn giving you some props. We got to talk solar, Okay. a topic that's close to your heart, open-ended, anywhere yeah. you want to go to start. Well, I've, I've been in solar since 74. Right. It was full-time from 74 to 86. First in Montreal, then in Virginia, where we started Virginia Solar on the downtown mall. So uh, I know a little bit about you know, creating trust and starting a company. And my observations, and I know you want to talk about Segor, is that they took the shortcut to, to uh, building a company by spending a lot of money on advertising and marketing instead of building relationships one at a time. I think that was reflected in their mixed reviews. Some of them loved Segura, some homeowners did not. It's not a secret. Uh, give you an example of what I think is the way to go. Richard Chrysler at Sunday Solar, uh -huh. a long time ago, bought his office building on River Road. Has an income stream, no bull burgers is their tenant. They have solar everywhere on their roof so they have no electric bill. If anyone wants to talk to the president, Richard, he's there. You know, trust is high. There's no doubt that they're going to be in the community. So I think that's, that's the key. Paul Reisberg at Alt Energy used to be like that until he moved away. Uh, Devin and Rich at Sun Tribe are like that. The, you know, if there's a problem, it starts at the top. And I think this Sun Tribe or this Segura guy, he's the only guy in solar I don't really know. And there's a reason. I don't know he's not around. He should be here right now, writing the ship. He's talking to Andy Bindia, the yeah. founder and former CEO of Segura Solar. And look, I, we got a lot of folks that watch, and, and, and I think it's important to highlight that the demise of Segura is not indicative of the industry across the board. And I think that's what you're trying to do here. Absolutely, nor is it of the people who work at Segura. By the most part, they're good intention, they're smart, they're hardworking. I know some of them, you do too. But if there's a problem like this, it's really the fault of the people at the top. And you know, you could tell they're just too diverse. When you go on their website, they're, I think they're trying to get their part-time salesmen to know everything about insulation, windows, heating and air conditioning, and now they're selling electric car chargers. That's not the way to do it. Absolutely. Not at all. I agree 100%. So what's the message that should be taken from here, and what's the feedback that you've he heard from the marketplace since the Segura home house of cards has started to crumble? Well, first I'd pause a little bit on condemning them, and let's give them a chance. Mike okay. Ball is trying to right the ship. He's a smart guy. We play hockey together, so I've known him for a long time. 
but it's a red flag to me that the uh, the Sandy guy is not in town helping Mike do what Mike's trying to do is pay the bills, get the installations back. So, you know, I would pause. I don't want to ever criticize anyone unfairly or, or prematurely, but uh, you know, the the uh, red flags are out there. So I was I mentioned. Sunday Solar and Alt Energy, which is now Tiger Solar, there's a lot of great companies, and they have a high degree of trust. Because who who does a homeowner want to work with? With somebody they know, like, and trust. Right. And and you can get that when you talk to the owners. Like Richard Chrysler, keep talking about. We go back to 1980. He used to live at my house. He watched me do solar for 10 years, and then sometime in the 2000s, he he got the bug. His brother was also in the solar business, and. He segued from his previous business to full-time solar, and they're doing great. I don't have any problems recommending Sunday Solar. I love it. I love it. Woody Fincham uh, mentions Logan Landry, the former CEO. Woody says Logan is a smart guy and an ethical guy, um, and his new venture will be worth watching. Um, Logan with Senvar mm -hmm. Roofing now. Um, he's a guy that uh, I've had conversations with. And I'll, I'll give Woody some props and echo what he said. You had something on and, your mind. Well, Woody is the go-to appraiser for any, any home that has solar or any kind of alternative energy, geothermal or whatever. He took, he took great care to train himself into these alternative t technologies. And so he's, he knows what he's talking about. And I love his idea when, it, when we talk about zoning later, about limiting it to just residential changes. I hope the city adopts Woody's idea. There's Nikki. We'll talk uh, Nikki Chambliss coming on set here and in studio. We'll get to uh, Nikki here in a matter of moments. Why don't we talk uh, upzoning or rezoning? Rezoning, yeah. Yeah. Your thoughts open-ended on that, anywhere you want to go. Well, I'm no expert, and I sort of hesitated to try to delve too deeply into it, too prematurely, because I know there's going to be changes. But I, can re I rely on Bob Pinio, Richard Price, guys who are really at the forefront of that. They spend a lot of time and are on the committees to advise the city. But I do have one property in the Woolen Mills that I've owned since the 90s that I think is going to be like the poster child for what's good about this. And I'll just give you a brief introduction. It's on uh, it's a rental house on 1317 East Market, 10,000 square foot lot. Uh -huh. Now I always wanted to build a second house in the back. It's a perfect location, it's flat. Everyone loves the Woolen Mills it's for obvious reasons, but you need 12,000 square feet to build two houses. But under the new RA zoning, according to Bob Pinio and Richard Price, if I keep the existing house, which is an old house that could be bulldozed, but I you know, keep it up, I can build three small cottages in the back on, on sublots and either rent them or do a lease purchase or sell them or sell the lots to a builder like Mike Sadler and have a nice little cottage community, a la Ross Chapin or... Sarah Suzanka, you may know those names. Oh, yeah. They build like these small home communities oh, all yeah. over the country. And that's a, that's a win because we have three new homes in the Willow Mills. Uh, they'll, be, they'll match the other homes in the neighborhood. It's like a half a block to Mead Park Pool, Firefly. You no, know, it's, it's great. Um, it's a Andrew, dead end street. Andrew right. Hickson giving you props. Oh, okay. um, we'll talk about Andrew soon. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Um, Bob Pinio, fantastic architect. Yeah, he's been on the show with Richard. Who's come on the I Love Seville Network. Richard Price, a fantastic developer and yeah. squash player. Yeah. Richard Price, the visionary behind the, and I will get it right. Hold on, give me 10 seconds here. Richard Price, the visionary behind the high street 11 development. 1130 condominiums we, yeah. we built and sold. You were a them. part of this. Yeah, I did. I, he and I did the project. Richard designed it. I found the land and... You know, I know he was looking. And we sold all the uh, condos for about $300 a square foot. And I just resold this one of the, there's two I resold for like three fifty dollars a square foot. Now, I mention that because downtown condos are going for $600 a square foot. The two at the Belmont Lofts are five sixty dollars and six sixty dollars a square foot. So and we did a great job. People love the little condominium community. It's two stories. It's around a courtyard. And it was affordable relatively affordable. I'm not saying it was all cheap. All things considered. Right? Yeah, all things yes. considered. Yes. Um, Gwendolyn yeah. Gale Cassidy watching the program. She says, woohoo, go Roger. ADUs are our absolute future. 
Um, and, you know, I certainly am a huge proponent of the ADU as well. Um, Woody Fincham says those condos are very cool. We valued several of them. It's yeah. great to know an appraiser like Woody Fincham. Nikki Chambliss now oh on gosh, screen yes. here. We've talked upzoning, we've talked solar, and we've talked the 1130 condos. Thoughts on any topic, we will oh adapt gosh. to you. Wow, y'all had your coffee this morning, didn't you? <laughs> Always. Okay, so you know what? I just have to plug a local business you mentioned in that area, and I was yeah. thinking Firefly and all that. Like yeah. Holly's Diner is right there. Oh, well, Holly's Diner right across the street. got to bring that up because Thank it's you. also a local business that yeah. does a lot of music, which is Good very near and dear to my heart. Uh -huh. And like a key feature of our area. Oh, absolutely. The fact that we have so much music and such a music, I don't know, music scene makes it feel like I'm talking about like, I don't know, DC or something. We, do, we don't have that, and in some ways I wish we did. But what we have is pretty incredible, yeah. especially for being a big, small town. Yeah, small town, yeah. It, it, there's a lot there and a really cool community of amazing people. You've seen so. the evolution of the music scene firsthand, 46 years in Charlottesville? Okay, I remember when we started Live Arts, uh, the, very oh, first, nice. the very first Live Arts Gala was across the street here. And uh, there was this beautiful voice coming in the dark, and it was Dave Matthews singing for the first time outside of uh, the Millers. He was, you know, bartender at Millers. That was the beginning of, uh, of him. And then I, I was on the roof of the pink building, Ruhalak Toledano's building on South Street. Oh, yeah. And that was their first time they played as a band. And I just happened to be there. I didn't really know much about it. And then I, they segued over to uh, Max and Trax, which is now gone. But I used to hang out at uh, Trax. I Trax came that. first. And then Max was the country band next to Trax. Absolutely. Trax was like my hangout. Because I forget the guy's, Bill Elder, I think was his name. And he had a WordPress, he was like a word processing guy. And, yeah. and that's where Dave Matthews Band played. Awesome. First concert yeah. I ever saw in Charlottesville <laughs> in 2000 was at Tracks. Yeah. It was an unbelievable so you know. concert. I think I spent like, the cover charge I think was like four bucks to get in. Oh, uh, yeah. And it was um, as intimate a setting as the Southern is. And it had nice. acts and talent come through that place that were world class that you literally could almost touch in the front row, yeah. the people on stage. Same year as the CNO uh, bar underneath the CNO current bar, yeah. CNO club. Yeah. I don't know if anyone who's listening has, was, that was in the 80s. That was so much fun. That's that was, where I met uh, the Stone Wheat things. That was, that was uh, the Sandy McAdams era, was it not? So, well, Sandy started CNO. Yeah, then. And here's a point Sandy was at the CNO every night, shaking hands telling people who he was, asking them how, that's how a business should be created, not by somebody going off to Haiti trying to you know, help them. I, I mentioned that because if he really wants to help Haiti, he should have donated money to Building Goodness Foundation because they know how to help Haiti. Oh, nice. There it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? There it is, there it yeah. is. All right, so a lot of topics we want to cover. Um, we'll head to rezoning and upzoning, and then we'll weave these questions in that are coming in here. Why don't okay. you start Question. on upzoning, rezoning, and then... Not really my, not really my okay. area of expertise, okay. so what I'll do is I'll contribute in this one as I can, Yeah. <clears throat> and we're going to let you run with this one, Roger, and I will possibly even ask questions. Sure. How do you think it's going to impact this community? Well, uh, right now, I hope they take uh, Woody's idea, because if they just... Limited to residential changes, I think it'll be more positive than negative. I know there's a lot of angst about building 7-Elevens and, and vape stores in a residential neighborhood, and you know that's what happens when it's you know not very clear what they're doing, and it's almost too too much at one time. It's too broad. So maybe the city of Charlotte is listening now, and they'll take Woody's suggestion and just focus on residential because everybody wants more housing. Yes. You know. Uh, well, not everyone, uh, but yeah, we need it. We need more right? housing. We need it. And here's an example. I tried to build a second house in a great neighborhood, and I can't because we need 6,000 square feet. Well, why do you need 6,000? Why not five? Because there's, there's hundreds of lots in the Belmont area on 5,000 square feet. So, But just to get that one little change was almost impossible. I gave up yeah. until, until now. Do you make... Does the dirt, we talked about this with Woody, and you got a boatload of uh, realtors watching the program right now, including some elected officials. We'll highlight Jesse Rutherford. Uh, we'll highlight our boy Bobby Yarborough in Redfields. We got uh, Travis watching in, um, in southwestern Virginia in Danville. Mike Pruitt, who's going to be on the show tomorrow, Almore County Board of Supervisor. Lloyd Snook, saw you this morning. Mayor Snook, good to see you again. 
Um, Liza Borchus, Johnny Garver, Jason Howard, Lonnie Murray, um, watching the program, Chad Wood, Michael Plecker, hello. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. And Nikki, you jump yeah. in anytime you want. Definitely. Um, we work alongside investors here, and the investors that I'm working alongside have said, Jerry, show me an opportunity to buy something um, where I could potentially get X return on my money. And I'm not going to tell the number because I'm not trying to stigmatize anyone, but a developer, when it's all said and done, wants to make money. That's the name of the game. So the developer has said to me, show me something land-wise that I can buy. I got this cash ready to go, and I want to be able to do X amount of return on my purchase. So my concern is, maybe concern is not the right word because I'm also in the for-profit business as well, that the dirt becomes a bit more opportunistic. As the dirt becomes more opportunistic, then the developer is going to be more opportunistic. And as the developer becomes more opportunistic, the density that goes on that dirt is going to come at a price point that is going to be far from affordable. Well, are you talking about a guy who wants to buy and then flip the land or a builder who wants to buy and build a house that could be sold? Because... A guy that wants to buy the dirt and develop it into uh, doorways and uh, bedrooms. Okay, well, that's a little bit different than just, and I wouldn't call them an investor so much as a... A developer. Yeah, a yeah, developer. Yeah. And Working with one now. There's no home that's not built by a developer or by an owner operator. But let's face it, we're not going to solve the affordable housing problem with, without developers. In fact, the best suggestion someone told me once is, if the city of Charlottesville wanted to build more affordable housing, just hire Ryan Homes. So who knows better how to build a lot of homes in a fast period of time that's affordable? Now, they're not the best, best name in town, but they know what they're doing. They've been doing it since, I think they've been doing it as long as I've been alive, which is since 1949. They also have a luxury division. Yeah. MV Homes that a lot of folks don't know about. Um, yeah. That's them. But you're right. They do come in at a price point that a lot of folks cannot duplicate. Absolutely. But that's because the economy is the scale, the purchasing power, and the vertically integrated nature of their model. Yeah, and they build most of the house in a factory, and then they ship it down. and put. They can put up six townhomes in three and a half months, and they pre-sell them all, too. Right, right, right. Nikki, any thoughts on any of this? So my brain keeps going back to the other zoning conversation before, yeah. truly. Like, my brain attached to that, and I'm just like, where are we on that? But that's not quite, you know, I guess it's all related. It's interconnected. You know, I do think Ryan has a little bit of a stigma there. Yeah, And they it's do, also but... still an entry point into home ownership. So, yeah, I mean, Woody Fincham on the show yeah. last week said, hey, not every house has to have hardy panel or hardy plank. Oh, Could gosh, have vinyl. Yeah. yeah, not at all. Yeah, so, I, you know, Ryan will, Yeah knows no. how to do that well and in that case like one of the differences for people who don't know is that you just don't have as many choices right it's yeah. not the customization yeah and then like you mentioned the different levels of quality yeah but, but we're talking about getting home. people in a You're shelter getting in home ownership exactly what do you think about you building, the up, dirt? <laughs> building up to well solve it's this. inevitable look around the world right yeah why the resistance for building up in this community oh. i don't know i mean uh, keith woodard and Greg Powell designed an 11-story uh, condominium project. They pre-sold 26 units at $600 a square foot. They were going to, they were going to create a the market plaza and. Uh, then he walked cost, away from millions of dollars of underground infrastructure. The talk too, it took so long. The market changed. The, and the cost went up so much. They needed to add a second or the 12th floor, and at that time the city of Charlottesville apparently down. turned them down. Yeah. And Keith said lose a little now or a lot more later so he took you know took a small loss well relatively small a couple of million dollars yeah and greg powell lost too he was the architect well, so I think a lot that of people here like a lot of when i talk to like local locals who have been here for I, have you been here since 77 77 okay yeah. so not 46 life. years not my whole life 46 okay. years for him 23 okay. years for me yeah okay so then I, one of the conversations i have with a lot of people who definitely enjoy the benefits of growth in our area but sometimes struggle with the nimby not my backyard sure. right or the oh i don't want tall buildings i think it's that idea of this city regardless of where it has been in the last many years has always had a certain charm about it 
that seems to be one of the main topics that people are concerned about losing. And there are yeah. other things about that, but when I pick apart the pieces and I'm like, okay, got it, I understand that. We, it's gonna happen with any growth, it's statistics. Okay, next, what's the next thing? The thing that we land on that's not an easy numbers conversation is the charm. And I think there, yeah. that can be done well. Yeah. I think there are examples of it being done well. Right? And I can't think of one right off, but just you know, motorcycling around the state, you go across places where it's like, oh, they obviously are very intentional yeah. about their town and the growth in their town. Yeah, change is difficult for anyone. It's hard. You know, when I, you know, the city owned that land on the parking lot that we're talking about, I thought, wouldn't it be great if the city... You're talking the Water Street Water yeah, Development. Yeah, if city... No, that went well. ...created a development with studio and one-bedroom apartments where people who work downtown could rent them and or buy them and they wouldn't have to have a car. Our friend Oliver Just like Oliver, to do that. Oliver, Oliver wanted, wanted to, to do it. Side. That would be ideal. I'm and then say. Oliver got shot down for, I don't know, forget well, why. Well, because uh, the other conversation that happens a lot is, oh, service is terrible. And it's, well, when people yeah. can't afford to work here. And they're, the they're tired and when they get to work. They drove an hour. Yeah. And even then, that's still... Yeah, I don't know how they do it. What are they getting paid to be able to drive that hour? Exactly. I'll give some yeah. background on this exactly. um, and then jump back in the mix here. Um, Roger, so we're talking about two separate projects here. Um, we're talking about Keith Woodard's project, Market Plaza on Water Street, where he legitimately was going to create an epicenter for the farmer's market. The farmer's market right now is on an asphalt black surface parking lot in the dead of summer. 15 degree slope. Yeah, right. <laughs> and if anyone goes there in the dead of summer, they realize that it is hotter than Hades there. The quality of life for the farmer's market on this asphalt parking lot is not the best or not certainly not what it could be. So Mr. Woodard and his team watches this show, yeah. emphasizing that. Yeah. So they were going to build this epicenter for the, the farmer's market and also this mixed-use building that was going to include retail and residential, everything in walking distance of the downtown mall. He put a couple million bucks of underground infrastructure. We need to get the underground infrastructure before we can build up. And then the political climate in City Hall was so toxic that Mr. Woodard and his team legitimately chose to walk, around, walk away from a couple, ground, couple million dollars of underground infrastructure, then pursue this project in its, in its form. The second project we're talking about, then I'll stop talking, is Oliver Kutner. Oliver Kutner was going to do studio apartments or micro apartments um, about half a block off Water Street in one of his buildings. That ended up being an office building, the, the glass, development. called the Glass House. Yep. And instead of having studio apartments, we now have, how would you characterize it? Uh, a funky uh, office with many stairs and code violations that somehow Oliver made, made uh, work. Right. And he it, still makes work. He still makes work and not, I believe, at full occupancy. Probably not. So we do know, and I, I, can, I can say this with confidence, that studio apartments or micro apartments within spitting distance of the downtown mall would have been a smash success. Yes, yeah, home run, for sure. Home run, right? No doubt about it. Because folks in their 20s and 30s yeah. want to be able to walk to where they play and work. Yeah. And they would have done it. We see this in Manhattan. We see this in Georgetown and D.C. everywhere. Well, they're already weaning themselves from the automobile. So this is, they don't, yes. they're probably going to have little scooters at, at the most. How about the, the, the topic of office conversion to apartments? I know that's an expensive conversion. Yeah, that's, they just did a big study in New York. Yeah, that's a difficult thing. It's, mm -hmm. Imagine putting in bathrooms where it's the, it's the plumbing that bothers me. And then each unit will have to have a little air conditioner. You know, in an office building, you don't have that. Right. It's not that easy to do, in other words. Something I wanted to do here, but yeah. the money that was needed was out of my purview by far. Yeah. So I want to throw this to both you guys here. Um, we know we want density, and we know we want more housing, because if we do additional supply, that may stabilize price points. At least that's what the folks are saying. Do we not have tangible data that perhaps says otherwise? We got these studio apartments that Oliver tried to bring to market. I'm very curious of your take on the High Street project with those apartments in the floodplain by the Rivanna oh, River. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's your take on that? So I want to go anywhere on this topic for anywhere you guys want to go. Why don't you go first, Nikki? Okay, yeah. So I want to start on this because I think part of it is 
that when we're looking at these things, and I'm not crazy in the know to specifics of history here, right? But the broader picture is what happens is a lot of times these small studio areas end up still being crazy priced because they're walking distance, because they're mm. new, because oftentimes they're very modern and it pretty freaking cool is what they usually yeah. are, right? When people are promoting this, they're not trying to do this. Well, first of all, you don't want it to not look nice. That would be really uh, not so smart. But then they end up being priced in such a way where it's really not serving the purpose that we're talking about. And I don't have a solution to yeah, that. It's possible. I mean, it's up to the whoever's the yeah. owner is going to charge yes. what the market will bear. And, and it's an also important to emphasize that even if they do come in at a high price point, that that is then going to open up price points lower on the pricing spectrum. Because folks will fill this high price point that otherwise we're pursuing a lower price point, which would then open that up for the marketplace and others to go after. Your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, other areas. Well, affordable housing, I first think of the three words, land, labor, and lumber. Because if you mm -hmm. can't get your land or your labor or your lumber less expensive, you're not going to have the sum of the three equal affordable housing, what we call affordable. So uh, land, so Habitat for Humanity, they're experts in, in doing this. And also the labor, they require the owners to contribute mm -hmm. labor. Lumber, I heard they got some sweet deal through uh, a NAFTA violation that Canada uh, was fine and they have to supply framing lumber to Habitat for Humanity from Canada at a discount. So they're, they're kind of a, uh, attacking, that's why Habitat's so successful. And by the way, we should give props to, uh, to Dan and- uh, Dan Rosenswag. And Kelly at Habitat for Humanity, the whole team, because we have one of the largest uh, Habitat for Humanity operations wow. in the country with that's regards incredible. to land and lots. South of Mobile Home Park is a great well, they example. Do amazing, uh, they, they are amazing for our community. What yeah. they do contributes in a huge way. They're gonna <laughs> transfer all those people that are in those mobile homes into newer homes. And Have you been out there? They have this, uh, Dick Sporting Goods donated a little soccer I pitch saw. In, yeah. around the, the homes. I took a uh, I took a uh, one hour jaunt through um, the new Southwood project, and and there is a lot of beauty there um, and functionality as well. How do you guys characterize today's real estate market? Okay. Challenging is that a part? Statistics. I mean, yeah. First of all, I think when you ask anyone in the business, we're not holograms. In other words, what we say is not going to reflect the market perfectly. If we had a bad week, we're we're going to be down. If we had a great month, we're going to be. So that's why I get to statistics. Statistics are pretty bad. Low inventory, high prices, tough time to be a, a buyer, good time to be a seller. But one thing I like to interject is the interest rates, everyone talks about them being high. In 1982, I bought my house, interest rates were 16%. Nice. And Virginia Solar paid 24.5% for our company loan. Imagine those two at one time. So although they're high now relatively to the last eight or 10 years, they're not yeah. prohibitively high from yeah. buying a home. Look into adjustable rate mortgages. Look into buy downs. Like builders are going to, are more and more buying down the interest rate for their, their homeowners. Juicy Camp would call me. Sorry. No, totally. They're watching you on the show right, right now. Though. Yes. Nikki, well, jump in here. No, I love that your answer was statistics. I think yeah. that's incredible. And I will say so from the buyer seller perspective, I know it doesn't feel like it, but it's not as bad as it could be. It's really not because that stability that we talk about with our area, because we're more transitory in, in nature with a various, very large, impactful yeah. aspects, NGIC and UVA being two of the top ones, yeah. you're, we're actually, it, it could be a lot worse. And I, I hate to like, you know, have that be the context. And some days that really needs to be a thing that's said out loud and there's still a way. Right? Is it the easiest time to be a new home buyer? No, no. That first home time home buyer, it is challenging right now. And it's still possible. So it's a matter of taking a look at what it is you want, digging into that a little deeper and being like, okay, so what's the why behind that? Because a lot of times people want to say, oh, you know what, I want my forever home. Okay, so usually people aren't gonna stay in a home for forever. If right. we're talking to somebody in their 20s and their 30s, right? So what about the stepping stone, right? We talk about that a lot. What is the stepping stone? Could that help you get what you want mm -hmm. and build a better foundation for the future forever home, whatever that may be? 
and in our area, that's a really good way to go. It's important for people to get into the market to become homeowners because the way you win in real estate is by being in the market for a yes. good, good amount of time. Same with stocks and bonds. It's, you know, flipping is not the way to go with either Hold stocks them. or homes. Oh, yeah. Hold them. It's not timing the market, it's time in the market, as they say. I love that. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. How do you yeah, think nice um, a drop in rates is going to impact this market? More competition yeah. for, for the buyers. There'll be more buyers. Yeah, exactly what it's done the last couple of times. But it, if it goes really low to where it used to be, like three, then sellers will come. There'll be more sellers. That'll, it's got to get to that level where yeah. the sellers are not afraid to lose their current mortgage. You know, yes. that no one wants to lose a three and replace it with a six and a half. That's what we talk about all the time know. here. I know yeah. you do. Um, what, what, I'll throw this to you. Where is, um, where is that drop in rate threshold that is going to get someone like me who, you know. Andy Zeman, are you watching? Because you could answer that. You got <laughs> I don't know. It's probably in the three or fours. That's, that's the question I'm going to ask. What's that number that's going to get someone like me at a 275? A 275 rate um, off the fence and to deploy 700, 800K in equity. Well, you don't have to match your current low rate because you're going to have a lot of equity. You can put down more cash so you have a lower mortgage, assuming you're going to get a mortgage. So maybe your, your monthly payment will be the same even though it's at a higher rate. So it's something close to three or four, I would say. So three or four, we're you think pretty far away. We're pretty that. far away. Pretty far away from because right, we're flirting with the seven. Yeah, that's, right now. That's bad. What do you think? What do you think, Nikki? Well, I think if you're using yourself as the example, I'd be like, why on earth are you considering selling that property? Don't do it. You know better, um, <laughs> right? I, truly, it would have to be a really sweet something, or you would have to be upgrading your investment portfolio in a way for that to make sense, right? Or you had children and you're outgrowing your current home. Well, but he but could rent it out. I don't mean him. Yeah, no. yeah, for, no, totally. Someone and that's, that's a lot exactly. of times. And a lot of times people don't want to have that investment property. And if they really yeah. don't want it, that's fine. I know I get, I get flack from realtors because they're like, please, why do you keep encouraging people to, to invest? We really need the homes listed. I'm like, I get that. And really it's yeah. about what's going to work best for the person. I think, it, you know, those, you know, keep your current home and then as a rental, mm -hmm. it's kind of a bad idea unless it's really low cost because yeah. if it's over like four or five, forget about getting your money out. Then it becomes a rental. When you go to sell it, it's never going to look as nice. It's oh, going to be always a distressed I guess it property in some ways. Though, I mean, for me, I'd, I've got the long game. Well, a longer game, not as long as some, longer than others, right? I don't know. Well, if you had a five hundred thousand dollar house, you could sell it and buy two or three two hundred thousand dollar right. houses That's in another community, like in Jacksonville, Florida, oh, okay. that I've as discovered. As long as we're moving elsewhere, yes. Yeah, because yes. once you get out of your comfort zone and look past Charlottesville, I gave up on Charlottesville as a single family home rental purchase you were not alone a long that. time ago yeah yeah and luckily i discovered jackson the numbers just no matter what market we've been in here yeah. the numbers don't work here like a lot of investors want no. them to it used to be you could buy a house for 100 times the monthly rent forget that now it's 175 200 that was one of the most challenging conversations i had to have yeah. on a regular basis when working directly with my clients right who were investors which it's my interest so of course i'm going to attract and engage a lot of that and it was really hard for them to realize that this market wasn't what, it's like, hey, your numbers, I get it. You're yeah. doing the math. I know the math to you. Yeah. And I'm telling you, it's never going to match what you have in this other state here. Right, right. It's just not well, how Charlottesville works. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times that meant they were very frustrated for a while before they realized yeah, it. Yeah, and it's hard yeah. to go to another state. And well, it thing. is. Well, that's a perfect segue into the, uh, the real estate IRA. And the, yeah. uh, you want to you touch on that? Yeah. So most people, if they have a Roth IRA or a SEP IRA, if you're self-employed or an IRA, have it in a stockbroker's account. 95% of all people do that. Through REMAX International, I learned about Equity Trust Company, went on uh, some webinars, and Equity Trust is a self-directed IRA, also known as a real estate IRA. Self-direct is a better word. So then when I discovered that I could, I could do my own choices, make my own choices with regards to this money in the IRA, it was a no-brainer to open an account. I used Equity Trust Company in Cleveland. Tr the website's trustetc.com. I think there's a half a dozen companies. They've overall always been re uh, referenced as 
are the best overall company, and I, I recommend them. So uh, that's one of the best things I did because I had, I bought one house within the real estate IRA, and I realized, hey, I can't depreciate it, so it's on Elliott. It was in that guy's uh, video about what, what could happen badly. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It was 1,002 Elliott. So I took that 250000 and I, I now lend it to Jacksonville Wealth Builders in a series of 16 different notes, all six to two month or two year of maturity, and every month. But the money comes back into the IRA tax free, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And then when you reach a certain age, you have to take out, you know, one thirty of it each year, which is no big deal. So, but you can own uh, cryptocurrencies, you can own land, you can own artwork, you can own real estate, you can own anything you want. You make the own decision. So it's a little bit riskier, obviously, unless you don't, unless you trust yourself. So, so that the advantage of doing this is you're still an investor and a landlord, but you don't have the day-to-day -day operations, the maintenance, and potentially the headaches that you're responsible for. Well, now you're talking about the homes in Jacksonville. Yeah, they completely, all the homes I own, 10 of them, I've never been inside any of them. I've only seen three of them from the outside because I totally trust the company. I've been down there a couple of times. Jessica and I were just there. And they do all the management. And by the way, in Jacksonville, Florida, all the leases are like three years long. Right. That's really? what they, two to, th two, to th two is a unusual, two to three. And we have like a 97.8% uh, renewal rate. Mm -hmm. During COVID, the occupancy, before COVID was uh, 98.6 and after, during COVID was 98.2. We didn't lose like any tenants at all. Yeah, it was. Jacksonville yeah. was great. Nice. And the, the rent How'd you learn going. about this, Roger? Through a webinar at Equity Trust Company. So Remax led to Equity Trust, led to Jacksonville. So I talked to Greg Cohen down there. They only take uh, investors who want to buy and hold. So they flew me to Jacksonville. I spent three days there. I went to nine different homes. But the first one I saw was three bedroom, two bath, car garage, uh, one car garage, hardy plank and brick on a paved street, 6,000 square foot lot. What do you think it cost? In Jacksonville, I'm going to call it a buck sixty. Ninety-two thousand, and I rented for nine hundred and fifty at the time. Oh my gosh! Now it rents for uh, now I'm getting offers every day for three hundred thousand, and it rents for thirteen fifty. I think okay. so. It covers everything and then some. Yeah. After all, um, you know, taxes and insurance, I still have to pay. I think I net about a thousand from each house. It's great. That's significant. And questions coming in for you on this. Yeah. Um, this is from Brian, who's watching the program in Crozet. Um, does your guest first? He says, "Please bring this guest back. He seems to be a breath of fresh air and a wealth of knowledge." Brian also says, "Is your guest saying that the Charlottesville market has gotten so expensive that the average investor is having a hard time running a, a coherent business model?" Well, with regard to residential, now commercial is a little bit different. We've done pretty well in commercial, but again, it's a long-term hold. But yeah, I think a lot of uh, small investors are looking elsewhere. Like you know, if it costs 200 times the monthly income to buy a home, you, and you can find something else in Buffalo or Cleveland or Dayton or Jacksonville, yeah. and you can if you know how to look, then. Once you get over that fear of being out, I used to think if I could drive by everything I owned in a day, I would be happy, but I got over that. That's a yeah. negative belief. So once you can get over that, and then there's a wealth of knowledge, you know, on podcasts and oh, everywhere. so much. What's your favorite? Well, I, um, I listened to Get Rich Education on Keith Weinhold, and that's, nice. and he's had, um, that's a good one. He's had the, you know, Jacksonville Wealth Builders advertise, but he also had Peter Zehan who's a geopoliticist, and I read all his books now and listen to him every day. He's a brilliant guy. Nice. So he, you know, through Keith and that, um, that podcast and YouTube channel, it's, yeah. it's really... that's awesome. And he just focuses on single-family home purchases really? and rentals. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Occasionally duplex or something like that. Yeah. Um, you're getting, is it Michael V-Y-D-R-Z-E-L? Watching the program, oh, McCall, right? He's my hockey. He's from Czech Republic. He's a hockey player. Is UBA. he watching in the Czech Republic? Is that Republic? McCall? Yeah. 
Yeah, he's, hi, McCall. McCall yeah. is watching right now. He says, I'm listening to you right now, Roger, and I'm loving it. So he's watching in the Czech Republic, literally, as we're... So McCall uh, came over to the America with almost no money. He was, like, homeless in New York. Then he ended up at Eastern Kentucky University, or Western Kentucky, played hockey for us at UVA uh, when he was at Darden, and he went to Microsoft. Now he has his own business in, in Czech, Hi, and uh, he's one of my favorite guys. Uh, Gwendolyn Gale Cassidy watching the yeah, program. Great. She says, Mr. Charlottesville, Roger, you did not tell me any of this when we met last week. How are you? <laughs> she says, how are you selecting cities? This is a Harvard educated uh, viewer and listener right now. Well, I just happened to stumble across um, Jackson. By the way, Jacksonville Wealth Builders, aka JWB Capital, they do not go in other cities. They're completely hmm. focused, which is another lesson that I think Segura should learn. You stay, you know, you focus in your hometown until you've done such a great job that, you know, you're getting medals, which JWB gets, by the way. So I, I was thinking about, I wanted to do this in Buffalo, where's my hometown, and give oh, me a nice. connection. I'm going to go yeah. there for the Bills and Sabres games. And so, but, you know, you have to, I'd have to pay taxes in New York. And, I, mm -hmm. and Florida doesn't have taxes, income taxes like yes. that. So that's a big... And Ohio is another place I looked into, but I think I hesitated. You know, life's complicated enough. I didn't want to complicate it with <laughs> Life is complicated another, enough. <laughs> another tax return. Uh, Nikki, any thoughts on any of this? No, I love it. And I love that you brought the idea of investing out of state. That's another, like, because we've mentioned bigger pockets before, and that's, like, yeah. that's kind of my go-to for a lot of things, yeah. right? And they talk all the time and have guests all the time talking about, hey, get out of your comfort zone. It doesn't have to be local. And I think you're yeah, right, and yeah. it doesn't. And there's like the, I think a lot of the people that I end up talking to that want to invest locally, there's a combination of comfort zone, but for some of them it's a, they really just want to get back here. And so there's like a, a and I think there's probably a balance even for those people. Yeah. Because Coming you're home. right, the numbers don't work the yeah, same way. Not the same way, They no. do not. I so, like bigger pockets. I'm not active, but a woman yeah. called me up from bigger pockets, and it led to... Uh, I started a subdivision in Greene County called Meadow Ridge with a guy named Sunil Shako at Glenmore, and we're Mike Sadler's building a seven spec home, so we're building right now That's awesome. brand new homes in Greene County. Yeah, right close to the you know where the new sheets is. Oh yeah, it's like it's like a a nine iron from there. Um, Green County yeah. has got tremendous momentum and yeah. tailwinds yes. behind it right now as affordability has been a problem in Almaro. Folks are willing to head across the county line to Green where they're getting maybe 30, 40 percent discounts on brand new homes yeah. and just having to commute just a couple more minutes further. I am hearing from my friends at uh, Green County um, government that they're getting to a point of uh, capacity with what's in the pipeline yeah, I heard. and also getting to the point yeah. with um, locals that are saying, hey, uh, we got a lot of new units coming on the market, slow this down. So we may have hit the ceiling in green here. Um, time will tell. And that's, that's tough because that was the go-to affordable mm -hmm. place to go to and then. Yes. Louise and Flavanna, you've talked about them. Well, every, what's left? Buckingham County? No one wants yes. to drive down Route 20. Yeah. Well, and it's not even like Route 20 is challenging enough, but it's also beautiful, yet if you're really going into Buckingham, that's further away. Yeah, it's too far. Now, I will say I do feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, and it's just conversations I haven't been having, but I feel like Orange is still in that more drivable like range yeah, that Barbara's people still. don't think about. Yeah, like you're even, right. You know, like you can go all the way into Orange. Yeah. There's some really nice areas there. Like I live on the south side of Charlottesville, and it's maybe 45 minutes for me. So if you were anywhere further north with where you work or where you want to be. We have an Orange County you know? investor on the program right now, nice. Jamie Turner, mayor of Gordonsville. Um, Jamie Turner um, says, A, you, he says, this gentleman is awesome. Yeah. He's talking cool. about you. Thank you, Jamie. And he grew up in this area and has investment property in Gordonsville. Um, I will highlight the fact that uh, Paul Manning, Yep. And son-in-law, Chris Henry, Chris Henry, have a tremendous amount of skin in the game and a tremendous amount of future plans for Gordonsville, in particular downtown Gordonsville. Gordonsville was the home of PBM. Uh, yep. So Paul has got a lot of commitment to making Gordonsville special. One thing I've heard percolating in Gordonsville is the construction of a boutique hotel in downtown mm -hmm. Gordonsville. And as the Keswick patch... Mary Mill Trail, this wine and brewery trail becomes a reality, much like the 151 Trail in Nelson, I would bet 
that you're going to see a lot of investors target Gordonsville um, and this portion of Orange County um, with, with mm -hmm. land grabs. Time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah, Paul bought a lot of that from Hank Brown, who you've had on the show. And by the way, Chris Henry played. Uh, he was one of our goalies at UVA Hockey. I did not know that. I just texted. He was, he's in Barcelona right now. I introduced yeah. him to my high school friend who's a... <laughs> A cardiologist. I think there. he's That's in awesome. Barcelona pursuing getting an MBA. education. He's getting an MBA. An MBA He'll come in back. Barcelona. Yeah. Huh. He's uh, one of the most established, incredible um, developers and builders in this market, and the guy who uh, was the vision of Dairy Market yeah. um, and Dairy Definitely. Central. Chris, a good friend of the program. Coming in. Right. I love that place. I'll throw yeah, this too. to you. I'll throw this to you here. Um, and this question's come in from a couple of people. How difficult is it to start a REIT? Locally, real estate. Yeah. Well, I, I'm kind of involved in two mini REITs. I wouldn't call them REITs, but like Aaron Lawfer, who is a real very sophisticated guy. You might, he's on the down. I know Aaron Lawfer and great. his partner Trip Stewart. Trip, yeah. So they're buying. Play squash clothes. with them. Yeah. So Aaron looks hard for real estate opportunities, and 15 years ago we bought what's now called the Da Vinci Center. Yep. Where where uh, Aquafloat is. There are my clients. Mm -hmm. So uh, Aaron put together um, eight investors, and it's not a REIT, but it's like a, it's a mini investment club. I would and call then, it a consortium. Yeah, and then Mark Brown, when we bought the Charlottesville Ice Park and turned it into the Main Street Arena and then resold it to Jaffrey, we bought the Tall Oaks Technology Center, which used to be Nimbus Records in, in green with the, like the same investors. Mm -hmm. So that's like another consortium, which I highly recommend to people who are listening you can find people that are smarter than you or have more money and just sort of get involved with being a small investor with them. Because being a small investor is almost as good as the whole thing. My, uh, our ment my mentor, Bill Nichman, yeah. uh, who owns the Professional Center on the Mall, just sold um, a, huge poor, a huge building on Dale Avenue to a consortium yeah. of... of I want to say eight to twelve guys my age, mm -hmm. um, and and a lot of these guys tied to the company GovSmart. Oh, I know that. Brent yes. Lillard. Yep. Uh, Brent, I'm going to get you on the program. I know you watch the show, but the guys pulled their resources and bought close to a city block. Yeah, I know the building. Hmm. It's where um, Francisco Portel operates. He's. A, you should get him on this. He's the a genius. I. You want to do an introduction? We'll get him on. I'll get, I I'll trust your judgment. You, yeah. uh, he's, Neil he's Williamson good. for Roger. Um, he's the president of the Free Enterprise Forum, Neil Williamson. He says, a good barometer of Greene County is this week's planning commission meeting. Watch rezoning for 500 homes along US 33. By the way, the buy right density would, only, would allow only um, SFR. The rezoning would allow attached product. So he's basically saying, and yeah. he lives in Greene County, Neil. Yeah. Sean Tubbs reported something like 250 homes coming to Standardsville. I think that's the same thing. Is that the same thing, uh, Neil? Jump in with some perspective here for us. We would love to hear uh, some thoughts on green. And Neil, I would love to hear this question. Are we at a capacity with future development in green when it comes to housing, like I'm hearing percolating um, from stakeholders in green. Well, and by capacity, you mean people's tolerance for change. Yes. Because yeah. it's not about land. They've yeah. got the dirt. Yeah. Right. But the tolerance for change drives political capital oh, yeah. and who gets into office. Yeah. I just wanted to say that out loud, not because I didn't think you knew, but for people to realize sure. that's what we're talking about. Yeah. I think sometimes it's easy to hear like a sound bite and not let it digest, because yeah. we've got a lot of sound bites hitting our brains, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. I think Almore County is a perfect example. Oh, yeah. Look at who we're voting into office. And, you know, I'm not throwing shade at anybody, but the folks that are being voted into office are the ones that are not opposed to development, or, or opposed to development, excuse me. You got, you know, Supervisor Malik, who's running for re-election, either her fourth or fifth term. Supervisor uh, B. Lapisto Kirtley, running for a second term. You got Diantha McKeel on either her third or fourth term. Ned Galloway on his second term here. Yes, we have Mike Pruitt running, and he's running unopposed in the Scottsville district. So he's going to win. So he's, he's taking Donna Price's place? He's, Donna Price is not running. Yeah. So Mike Pruitt will be, and he's coming on the show tomorrow, and he's watching now. Mike Pruitt is going to be on the board. Okay. But he's yeah. one of six votes. Yeah. So while he's very pro-housing, five beats one. And five beats one every single day. So the likelihood of any new development in Almora County is 
So where are all these new employees coming for the Data Science Center and all the construction going on at UVA? They're going to have to live somewhere. Or Paul's Biotech Institute. Yeah. And all the ecosystems built around it. And yeah. these are six-figure jobs. So these six-figure jobs are going to cannibalize, not cannibalize, they're going to pursue the available real estate now, which is going to then push anyone under a six-figure job further away from the epicenter of employment. This is a very real... I don't want to say problem, but like, so Charlottesville, I'll throw this to you, Roger. Charlottesville is such a coveted place to live, this area, and that's why we live here. But we're almost in some ways victims of our own success when it comes to affordability. It happens almost every nice, look at, look at Greenwich Village in New York City. Like, if that was yeah. the place to go, and now, now what it is, it's just a, a you know, bedroom community full of expensive condos that no one can afford. Probably people from other countries buying the condos, not even living there. Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a real tough thing. Well, I don't have any answers. Of, yeah, I think a lot of times it's, it's driven by, backed by fear of either the unknown or an idea that we have in our heads. And I, I can be very understanding of that, right? And having more conversations, having better conversations, and being able to educate and build trust that growth would look in such a way that people are more comfortable because I think a lot of times people really do want that and there's not the trust there. So when you add up the lack of trust and you have that you know, fear of what that could look like for this community that people really love. Like I, I joke about it being the vortex because I'm like, oh, you know what? I know you're moving out of town, but I'll see you in about five to 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, you, you might be coming back. Well, I mean, some of the best four years of my life were at UVA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's then why I was people like, come back. That's what I'm saying. The hook. The well, hook. The, well, that's why the they newspaper. call it the, the hook. Yeah. There's a song about that. I thought it was, the gentleman, I thought it was the gentleman C. That's why they called it the hook. Uh, I don't know, but how it's been, you can ask how it's I, I I'm pretty sure it's because people come back. Yeah. And it also, the hook is a, uh, a nickname for the gentleman C that when you went to the University of Virginia or you attended the University of Virginia, if you showed up for class, uh -huh. you often got what was called the gentleman C. Really? Which led for passing uh, and a degree. Really? And That's that special. was nicknamed <laughs> the oh, hook. hook. The C, the C was gotcha. the gentleman C. So Neil Williams said, uh, he says, Roger's exactly right. The project that you were talking about is the project he's talking okay, about. Good. So you were 100% right. And he also says, Greene County is reaching political capacity on new development. The physical capacity, water, sewer, and schools are mm -hmm. sufficient for development, but the political it's capacity is not there. That's what I'm hearing as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, this is from also uh, Neil Williamson mentioning Sean Tubbs, which is what you mentioned, yep. from Sean Tubbs' newsletter, the first is a public hearing on a request to rezone nearly 140 acres near the town of Standardsville from R1 residential to plan unit development to allow for a community of 500 units with a mixture of 150 townhomes and 350 single family detached units. The Greene County future land use map designates this area as mixed use village center and a portion of one of the parcels is within the town. Is it walkable to downtown Standardsville? Because if it is, that could be a you know a boon to that. Mm -hmm. That that's, the town's already been bypassed, and it's it must be hard for the merchants to make make a go of it. That's a good follow-up question for you, um, Neil. Thoughts yeah. on any Green County related? No, there, I Nikki? love that. The Standardsville was the first area that I started really working when I got into real estate. Yeah. Because people didn't want to go there, and I lived in Scottsville, so it's not like when wow. living. Yeah. But it was an opportunity, and yep. people wanted to ignore it, and I was like, oh, I'm here for that. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, I had a CRV with all-wheel drive because a lot of those roads required it. <laughs> pretty, yeah. Mm -hmm. pretty yeah. rural. And uh, never had damaged tires, which was also a high risk on some of those <laughs> roads. But I, like, I loved it. I love helping people. I love areas. I love where we live. Yep. So it worked, did a lot of work there. I would love to see something like that benefit that town. Um, you're right. Being bypassed really yeah. does have a huge impact on business owners who also usually live in the area Definitely. and need to have businesses to be able to continue to do so. How about the uh, Katie Pearl hello, Logan Wells Claylo hello, uh, many of your colleagues uh, at Remax oh, really? all, all over the show right now, Roger. We love our Remax friends. Um, <laughs> walkability. 
walkability in this town and public transportation is coming up on the feed. I'll get to the specific questions, but I know this is something you like to pontificate about. How does the bus situation, how do they survive? Because I'm, I've just never seen anybody in the buses. There's five or 10 of them lined. I almost got in an accident because they were so lined up on Water Street that I couldn't see around the corner and a fire truck was coming the other way and I was in the other lane trying to get around the buses. Anyways, um, there must be some secret to how they serve. I guess federal grants or something, but whew, um, walkability is wonderful. I love the woolen mills for that reason. Do we need a better, okay, I'll rephrase this question. How important is a reliable and consistent and ubiquitous and approachable public transportation system for creating affordability with housing in Charlottesville? Ooh, that's a big question. I'm not an expert. I thought of two things. One, I wish the buses were smaller and, and maybe on call. And then they, also the buses need to go like jaunt far out to bring these people who live 30 minutes away. There's, there's a thing I always tell people about moving to Green or Louisa to, to save money is every 30 minute drive is about two or three hundred dollars a month on, on auto expenses which translates to like fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars of a home price if you didn't have that. So it's not, you're not escaping the affordability problem by going 30 minutes away, especially if you live, I mean, if you work downtown. So it's always a balance. People don't it's think about it. It's creating a not, challenge. The lenders don't even ask no. about that. They don't say, well, how much is going to cost you to drive 30 oh, minutes? No. Two, two people But your budget sometimes. hopefully factors that. And yeah. hopefully someone is having that conversation, your trusted advisor, right? You, if they rely on right? people like you and Yes, me. absolutely. No, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. There's also that aspect of depending on what your job situation is like, if you have good flexibility and trust, then you're probably okay. And if you do not and your car breaks down, yeah. you could be out of that job. Well, like, if the IRS allows 55 cents a mile deduction or more now, then that's the real cost. Yeah. And I think that cost, frankly, might be a little light. Yeah. Uh, yes. Because if anyone has uh, tried to price some tires or done any work yeah. on their vehicle um, in any capacity, they'll realize how expensive that is. Absolutely. Um, Neil says that a portion of the development is walkable to downtown Sandersville. That's good. Yes. And yes. he said, by the way, the Greene County 4th of July parade was absolutely awesome. Kevin says we need to explore a light rail partnership on existing rails. So um, Meredith Richard told me that she watches. I, I live on the CSX line. She said now it's owned by the state of Virginia, so the Commonwealth of Virginia owns that in preparation for a Charles Solar Richmond train, which she said is coming. We should, we should highlight um, Meredith and her role as an evangelist for the rail system. She's like the president of the, the, the I'll tag Train her right Passengers now. Association of America. Right. Something like that. I need to get her on the show. She, oh, she's for sure. Yeah. She should be on the show. She, she is, I would say, the biggest champion of... For decades. Right. She's a, she's a saint. Right, right. Do you think it's realistic, this rail concept system? I mean, why hasn't it materialized? Which is the question, going to, to Richmond or rails to? All the above. Locally, mm. rails, to, and then. I don't get it locally. Okay. It probably doesn't, yeah. I feel so like you see it, Richmond, work, Northern right? Virginia. Yeah, I mean, I took the train all the time from Montreal to Toronto. It was a, it was a blessing. It went from downtown Montreal to downtown Toronto. But that's two huge cities. And it was, say, it was a six-hour drive, I think. It took me maybe two hours on the train, maybe three. Um, well, quite no, a, go ahead. Not, I don't I see it happening. Say, the here. whole train life, I do think also it's not something we often, unless you're from a big city area, think about, no. right? So one, at one point, um, they, we had a function, a KW function in Roanoke. And I remember I rode, right, because it was a great motorcycle season and trip. But my backup plan was actually to take the train. And at that point, they had some deal going on. It oh, might yeah. have been like post-COVID life. It was like $8 each way for dropping in in Roanoke and having fun. So I think also that's that part of the conversations in education so that people have a better understanding of what this could look like and be more comfortable with it, right? So that there's no longer that fear base. 
I also think the walkability is similar to that because if I go visit New York City, I'm going to walk miles. I'm going to. And yet I live in Willoughby, which is only two miles from downtown Mall. And the idea of walking there makes me go, oh, why would I do that when (laughs) I can drive and park? But I would not view it the same way if I were in New York City thinking, oh, I want to go see that Broadway show and go to dinner there. No, I may take transportation. This is right up Peter. But I'm probably going to walk. Peter Krebs' alley, who came on the show on Friday, Piedmont Environmental Council. Peter Krebs, jump in here with some perspective. How about the Rivanna Trail? Love it. I love the bridge they put over Moore's Creek. It really completed everything. And uh, Mm -hmm. now we have a a trail where you don't have to ford a stream once or twice. Uh, Love it. How could that, how could the Rivanna Trail factor into um, safe walkability, bicycleability in this community for folks to potentially get away from vehicles and pursue a level of affordability where they can live in Charlottesville and not have to worry about, um, let's say, going to Waynesboro because they're priced out of Charlottesville. Once they go to Waynesboro, they realize, good God, I'm dropping three, four, five hundred bucks a month just to commute. So this affordability that I thought was truly affordable, I'm literally losing money versus paying the rent here in Charlottesville, and then just get around with the RT or maybe improve bike lanes and, and, and walking lanes. Well, I never thought of the trail being factored into what you're talking about. It's more of a recreational, and I wouldn't want to see it with a lot of bikes either. It's too crowded yeah. already. And I, I think, think that's works. what they're trying to push. Really? I'm yeah. Not, well, oh, some news is they, uh, you know, the bridge over the Rivanna from Pantops to, yeah. to East Market Street, which I thought was crazy. Did not get funding for the second time, so it looks like it's not going to happen. Um, this coming in from, gosh, the comments are coming in faster than I can keep up. Um, so this is from Woody. Trains struggle in the United States because most rail lines are owned by freight carriers and they have first rights to the line. Yeah. Amtrak constantly runs late because they have to stop and, low fr- uh, to stop and let low freight through. Um, that's from Woody. Uh, Neil says heavy rail i.e. the Virginia Railway Express is the most likely scenario. I've tagged Meredith, and I think Meredith is watching now. Uh, Meredith Richards, jump in here with any perspective, please. Um, This comment has come in. Um, Any thoughts to Jerry, and this is a pipe dream I've had, any thoughts to Jerry's gondola idea? Oh, that's from Kelsey. Is that on the downtown mall? Because I always thought it'd be fun to have a gondola go in the length of the mall. And by the way, you know where they do it? Where? Morgantown, West Virginia. Yeah, they do it a lot of places. University of Morgantown, or West Virginia yeah, University. Right. And a lot of folks don't realize this, that there used to be a, um, a trolley line that ran literally right down West Main Street. Yeah. I think like, Gabe Silverman wanted to do a trolley there. Dude, Gabe, someone put this on my Gabe radar. Gabe Silverman wanted to do a connector from downtown Charlottesville to Monticello. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he that was the idea. He tried to buy the old uh, hospital there. Maybe he did buy it. Hmm. I don't remember. Yeah, and, and he that was going to be an art center, center for artists of all kinds. And it'd be connected by this trolley. Right. Nice. And Gone Gabe had to put Gabe in perspective for everybody. Oh well, Gabe's one of my favorite guys. He's literally right across the street. Yeah, by tonic. There. Yeah, Gabe and, and uh, his whole family. They came from California, located like many Californians. Uh, to Moran Forest in Batesville. He was a big proponent of solar, and we did a lot of solar with his, uh, with his housing company. Great guy, you know. Uh, live art started in the Mickey building. Mm-hmm. So Fran Sackett and Michael Perrin and I, we went over with Gabe, and we looked for a spot for live arts, and we were looking on the second floor, and Gabe said, let's do it in the, in the corner down on the first level where Icarus Medical is now. And to Gabe and Ellie's credit, they instead of putting a parking lot, they put that little, uh, that little park where Tonic is. That was, that was like a gift to the community nice. uh, that they didn't have to do because you know parking was needed. Right. They could have easily mm-hmm. just put cars there. Yeah. Yeah. So Gabe was, uh, and he, you know, he and Ellie bought buildings on the downtown mall, Hamilton's restaurant. Mm-hmm. So that was going to be the Mud House. And I was working with Billy and Kate Hamilton, and Billy was kicking and screaming about downtown mall because it wasn't, hadn't turned the corner yet. But I knew the ice park was coming in and the mall crossing. And so finally got Billy to at least to look at that space. And Mudhouse changed their mind that they relocated to a smaller spot. 
So we worked out a deal with uh, Allie and Gabe, and uh, the rest is history there. They've been there 29 years. Alan Kajin listens to the show. Um, a bi-coastal attorney, lives in San Francisco. Lives Hawaii, up too. Ho okay, so now he's got he comes spots. here for weeks at a time. For he weeks at a here. time. Yeah. Um, owns the, some of the most marquee property in the city of Charlottesville. Um, has the Passiflora building, owns the parking lot on West Main Street where Wild Wing Cafe is, owns Wild Wing Cafe, owns a good chunk of the downtown mall. Um, this guy is a heavy, a heavy, heavy hitter. Gabe Silverman was his boots on the street, rest yeah. in power, Gabe Silverman here in Charlottesville. My Gabe Silverman story, 15 years ago when I launched this business, um, one of my friends introduces me to him. I go to his studio over here mm -hmm. where he literally has, it's Toys like a mess. everywhere. Yeah, a mess everywhere <laughs> on Market Street. I walk in. He's smoking a cigarette. He literally has the cigarette dangling from his lips. Yeah. I come in and say, I need some office space for my building. He has it dangling from his lips. He sizes me up and he goes, how much you need? I go, about three or 400 square feet. It's me and two other people. And then he goes, what you want to pay for? And I go, well, I can afford 300, $350 a month. That's it. He goes, how long the term? And I go, the shorter the better. He goes, I got you. <laughs> That's right. That's literally the story. Yeah, I believe it. Totally. And he was so willing to help. They owned the purple building on West Main where um, Feast is located. Oh, absolutely. The market. Nice. Main Street Market. Main Street Market. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. So um, I once was head of the community revitalization program at CAR, and I had to pick out a, 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 lead, a winner of the award for the year. Yeah. There was like 10 of us, and it was the simplest. We picked Gabe Silverman because he was like a no-brainer. Thank God he was married and Karen got him to come, because otherwise he would have <laughs> stayed at home at his office playing with his toys or doing some deal rather than coming and getting his award, but he, he came and got Sounds it. Sounds about Were right. he yeah. and Ali <laughs> college roommates? I don't know. I, I really. They probably did some deals in San Francisco, and because okay. you know, Allie's the lawyer and Gabe's yeah. the architect. Right. I don't know nice. if they went to Berkeley together or anything okay. like I, that. I think they were friends from college. Somebody might know who's listening. But yeah, viewers and listeners, if you can help us out in here, another building they own, the Rapture Building. Um, Allie, Allie owns that. I mean, you're talking about some of the most trophy properties, and he listens to this show, which is important to emphasize. Um, you guys make the show a dream. Roger, we got to welcome you back here. Um, Did I want to get to my list. I do, I do. That's what I'm saying. How much time we got? We got. Oh, let's call it ten minutes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Go anywhere you want to start with. Well, there's two two kind of. Well, there's three or four fun things. Uh, one, Tesla. I got some breaking news. After years of lobbying, the state. The Commonwealth uh, agreed to a sales and service center in Charlottesville. First was Tyson Corner, then Norfolk and Richmond. So all these Tesla people have to go to Richmond for a service if they do. But uh, we're going to have one in Charlottesville, but the location is a secret. Okay. I can't tell anyone yet. But In the city limits? No, I think it's... In I'm the, all county. Yeah. Okay. I think the... Uh, I get this from the uh, lobby group called uh, Capital Results. They're great. I think it's going to be a Fashion Square Mall. I know where it's not going to be. It's not going to be on 250 and 20 that where the car dealership was that Oliver had. Oh, yeah. Because that was too small for them. And there's not very many big places, and something tells me it's yeah. going to be a fashion so that is, mall. So that is breaking news. We should cut this into a That's sizzle incredible. reel for the 1230 show, what he just said about Tesla. Let's say this again. So we have Tesla coming. Coming to Charlottesville at an undetermined location, but we should know very shortly. Okay. Okay. Nice. Uh, some other breaking news. You were the first Tesla vehicle owner in this community, you know, right? No, Sandy Rusky at Apex Clean okay. Energy was. I was the first one who had ordered or maybe got the Model X, Okay. but not the only one. Okay. So I had to wait two years for my car. Okay. But I knew at the time, that was 2014, at the time I knew everybody by name who had a Tesla because there's only like a dozen people. Now there's like there's a, a dozen on Market there. Street yes, in yes. 10 minutes. Yeah. Tesla everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. So you think the Tesla... Epicenter or dealership is going to come to Fashion Square Mall. That's my guess. Mm -hmm. Somewhere okay. out 29 there. That is breaking news. Yeah. Well, but that's incredible to have that service center right so here. So, thing about a service, you can go take test drives. Right. You can you can look at a power wall, mm -hmm. and they have uh, they have a big uh, TV like this that shows all the superchargers in the world. It's it's quite a place to visit. And by the way, if you own a Tesla, most of the service is done at one's home. They come to your house. Okay. To do, you know, there's not that many parts to an electric car. Yeah. Like I had my 
cup holder replaced by Thomas, and he came to my house and did it in 15 minutes. We're going to cut that content and yeah. replay it on our 1230 show. Give us another piece. Another uh, breaking news is the ACC Hockey Commissioner said UVA hockey is going to be too good this year not to have a coach, and the coach moved to Boston. So he asked me to find one. So I first thought of Andrew Hickson, who's on the show. I thought about four guys who play hockey. And Andrew was the first guy I approached, and he immediately saw the opportunity and said yes. Now, Andrew lives on uh, Langford Lane in Belmont, not Belmont, uh, off of Ridge Street. Played hockey at Northeastern. Uh, he's a Canadian from Ottawa. Plays hockey in Richmond, like all the hockey players have to go to Richmond or Liberty University. And then he immediately uh, recruited an assistant, a guy from Richmond who played at Yale. So now we have two really good coaches. Nice. And uh, the team is, you know, we can't lose the team even though we lost a place to play. So nobody thinks about the UVA hockey team except people like me and the other the other coaches. So I'm really happy to announce that Andrews, and he put it. He put something on Facebook. He did. He gave you props. He's yeah. watching right now. Yeah, I put something on him, and he put it on his own page. But um, the UVA hockey page has a link to the story. I love it. I love it. What else we got? TEDx. Oh, TEDx. Well, there's a lot to talk about that. But basically, our committee is sort of dispersed. Somebody moved to Santa Barbara, Austin, Harvard, New York. So it's going to be hard to re recreate our Cracker Jack com committee to redo another one. But I wanted to tell a story about TEDx because I often wondered, did we make any difference in anyone's lives? And Jude, if you can go to sportsillustrated.com, si.com, and search the keywords Redemption Virginia Basketball, here's the story. In 2014, Donald Davis gave a talk at our second TEDx. He's a storyteller from New York, uh, North Carolina. And Laurel Bennett, Tony Bennett's wife, was in the audience. Four years later, UVA loses to UMBC in an ignominious, embarrassing loss. First time a top-seeded team lost to the lowest-seeded team. Tony was beside himself trying to figure out how he's going to help these young minds, these young athletes, overcome this you know, choking experience. Laurel said, Tony watched this TED Talk I remember four years ago. So he went on our uh, YouTube site or our, TED, or our website, found that Donald Davis uh, talk, was so impressed he made the whole team and coaching staff watch it a couple times. And it helped them change their uh, attitude towards this thing that happened to them. So what happened was when they went to Duke and played Duke, the Dukies were chanting UMBC, and Kyle Guy and, and Ty Jerome weren't faced by it, uh, uh, at least. They had purged their subconscious mind of this choking experience by telling the story about it. Which, so did you find that, that website? Virginia basketball. Anyways, yeah. the whole story... Check your uh, Facebook DM there, if you could, please. The Go whole ahead. story is on Sports Illustrated, told beautifully, including the TED Talk. Nice. Anyway, so it's, it's, um, it's wonderful. Then Tony Bennett three times gave credit to the, this TED, TED experience. But, get this, that's only chapter one of a two-chapter story. A similar thing happened to Tampa Bay Lightning in the National Hockey League. They were the first seed team, and they lost to the lowest seeded team in the Stanley Cup playoffs in 2019. And John Cooper, he, he was, you know, he's the coach. He goes, what am I going to do? This is terrible. It's never happened before. Someone told him about UVA. So he, he went and he learned about the UVA story, watched our TED Talk, got a UVA hat. And he made that the mantra for the entire year uh, to his team. Now, this team's composed of Russians, Canadians, Czechoslovakians, Finns, Swedes. They don't know anything about college basketball in this country. They ended up, make a long story short, they ended up winning the Stanley Cup. And then when they're on the, the podium, all the players are sweaty. They got their Stanley Cup hat. John Cooper, the coach, he has a UVA basketball hat on. That's awesome. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. So the moral of the story is you never know what you do how it's going to change someone's life for the better. Mm -hmm. In this case, it happened. We created indirectly. We helped create two championships. That's amazing. And that was like the highlight of Charlottesville the last five years. Is oh. that celebration of the national championship. That is absolutely amazing. Everybody and was so high. I, I want to highlight one more time here. Um, the Woolen Mills Chapel and Wool Factory Preservation Piedmont. So Preservation Piedmont is now the official owner of the Woolen Mills Chapel, which had been you know, falling on hard times. I mean, 
at the best, uh, neighbors were contributing $5 a, a year to the, the Neighborhood Association. Every once in a while, we'd raise some money. John Fink would, you know, contribute a couple thousand. We'd get the place uh, painted. Fred Wolf uh, was uh, in charge and taking taken care of the, the chapel, but somehow he did a deal with Preservation Piedmont, who has the resources and the, the bandwidth to help steward this beautiful building. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be all good. And That's it's amazing. The heart of our neighborhood. Oh, it is um, outside of the wool factory the most iconic aspect, right? That and the power plant across yeah. the street from me, which a guy named Phaedra owns, and I'm hoping he'll at one point come to the realization that he can't develop it, and then he'll donate the power plant to Preservation Piedmont, and then the, they can do something nice because. It's overgrown and there's broken glass in the power plant. It's not very safe. I've had uh, Rachel Burns. Hello. Um, I've had uh, one, two, three, four. Oh, you found it. Seven okay. people. I sent it to Jerry already. Seven people say bring Roger back. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, did you find the redeem redemption? Because I think Judah's doing a lot of things right now but here on the fly. It to yeah. It's right here. You, okay. yeah. Anyway, it's just fun to, to read that. We will check it out and we will put it in the, uh, in the feed, guys. Um, you guys are a dream. I'm very grateful for your time. Um, any closing thoughts? You know, I think it's amazing. So I, I know I didn't speak a lot on this show, but one of the things I love so very much, because Charlottesville is home to me now, right? And for a while, I was more transitory in life and. Pensacola, Florida was always still the place that I would refer to as home because I was transitory. <clears throat> and then I moved here kind of against my will. <laughs> I didn't really want to. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I was like, if I haven't heard of it ever, yeah. is it really a place to go? It's also a little far away from the ocean for my preference. And then I got here, and now this place is home, right? It's the longest I've ever lived in a place yeah. in my adult life, and I love it. So being able to engage in a way where I understand a lot of the history behind things and you're willing to share your experiences is incredible. And thank you. Oh, I love I, talking yeah, about it. I love it. We just <laughs> touched the surface. Yeah. Well, we'll I have, have to do one this thing again. I, one thing I've, I've prepared because I knew you were going to ask this question. Do you know what the Ho'oponopono is in Hawaii? No. It's a, it's a forgiveness and transformation ritual that the Hawaiian culture created. And I think... If we could somehow adopt that to our country, but maybe just our city. So basically, it's, it's summarized. You can go online and read about it. You say to oneself, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. And that's a, you say that to yourself or in a, in a relationship awesome. with somebody else. And it's a transformative uh, experience. Yeah. And it's worked wonders in this culture over in Hawaii. In fact, there's stories about healers going into prisons and changing the whole consciousness. But since we need, a, we need a healing in our community and certainly in our country, if we could, wouldn't it be fun if like 5% of the Charlottesvillians said the ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-ho-
not Cali, Seattle, but Keith is moving yeah. his um, daughter and granddaughter and son-in-law to Richmond. Yeah. And they will be um, Richmonders um, later this month, early August. And that makes Yona and Keith very happy. And joining yeah. the family business. Yeah. Which is exciting. Oh, really? Oh, Youngest yeah. daughter. Yeah. Yeah, I think I read that. Yeah. She'll be doing real estate in Richmond. Great, so, good mm -hmm. place to do it. Great market. Yeah. They have yeah, inventory. Absolutely. Yeah. Good place. <laughs> <laughs> um, for Roger, for Nikki, for Judah, this is Real Talk with Keith Smith. Keith will be back in, I believe, a week. Um, we are grateful for Roger and Nikki's time. I will 100% reach out again. This has been too long. Please do. Um, Judah, thank you for everything. We, we hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did. The I Love Seville show will be up in one hour, where we're going to make an announcement of a brand new talk show on this network that is going to take the talk show into a viewer and listenership that it is not currently reaching. And I'm super pumped to give you those details. Take wow. care, everybody. Nice. Can't wait to hear that. I know. I was like, can we get like a secret I will tell you tea all, moment? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I think he bought CNN. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's totally what happened.